When it comes to brain injury, younger is not necessarily better. So there's very much generally been a school of thought, even within the medical community, that, oh my gosh, kids, they're resilient. Y'all are going to bounce back beautifully. This is so different than maybe what we see in adults, um, where their life may completely change after an injury. What we were really finding is that is not necessarily the truth. One, the prognosis for these kids to really recover function of old skills, things that they acquired prior to the injury, that typically is better in early injury. But when we look at the prognosis for acquiring new skills after injury, new learning, that typically is worse after early brain injury. Each person is unique, therefore each person's recovery and needs are also unique. Here's what I really hope you walk away with today. One, this idea that kids are not just quote unquote little adults. Two, if we think about, for example, pediatric cancer and this idea of wanting to make sure that they continue to stay in remission, we need a similar model for our youth with traumatic brain injury. There's quite a need and also a real hope that can be set in motion um, by providing follow-up monitoring and support across the lifespan for these youth. And then lastly, strategies are for real life. And that is so important as we think of promoting brain change and uh, influencing and supporting function. TBI, it stands for traumatic brain injury. What is that? Well, the classic definition is what I have here. Really the idea that a TBI is an injury to the brain that's caused by a force upon the brain. So that could be caused by a bump, a blow, a jolt to the head. In some cases, a penetrating head injury, like a bullet, for example, to the head, something that's gonna disrupt the normal function of the brain. There can be kind of two sides to this story or two kind of aspects of this range of severity. One would be talking about our kids who experience those more moderate to severe injuries. So, you know, uh, typical causes may be being in a motor vehicle accident or having a fall from a high place, uh, for example. On the, on the lower end of severity would be our mild TBIs, also commonly known as concussion. The two age groups that are at the highest risk for injury are our youngest kiddos, our zero to four year olds, um, but then also our, our teenagers, our adolescents, especially those within that kind of 15 to 19 year age range. Something that a lot of people don't know is that TBI, traumatic brain injury, it actually is the leading cause of death and disability among children in the US. We are certainly seeing you know, an increased, um, not necessarily incidence so much as awareness, right? People are aware now that this is something that needs to be addressed. They're seeking care for more and more folks uh, in the medical system. Now, when we think of those kids um, whose injuries really warrant hospitalization, so again, typically our kids that are gonna be more those moderate to severe injuries. Oftentimes, these young people may have to spend days to weeks in the hospitals. Typically, when they're discharged, some recommendations are made to the schools. But generally speaking, oftentimes, once those kids are out of the medical system, back into the community, there's not a lot of additional follow-up care. Essentially, children are having to recover at each new stage of development. It's not a one-time phenomenon. How can we implement some proactive methods and then really explore how we can equip them with strategies to facilitate that growth and that real life function? Our bread and butter here at the Center for Brain Health is really cognition. So to narrow the lens there, assessment of cognition after TBI is really complex. So one of my favorite visualizations of this complexity or this hierarchy is actually a resource this is called the Building Blocks Model. It comes out of uh, the Colorado Brain Injury, uh, kind of State Department of Education. If you look at the bottom of the pyramid, think of these as some fundamental cognitive skills. So things like memory, processing speed, attention, inhibition, even aspects of sensory motor function or response. But another level up in complexity would be what we call intermediate cognitive skills, things like language processes. And then ultimately at the top of the pyramid is your real life functioning. So, 
you know, how that translates to your academic achievement or again, your reasoning in real life. Essentially, when you think about the brain and cognitive science, we've really learned that we weren't, brain, we weren't wired fundamentally to be good memorizers. Where we thrive is in our ability to get the meaning, abstract the gist of something. It's not about how much you learn, but how efficiently can you really pull out what's important. So one of the tools we've developed is called the Test of Strategic Learning. And it involves essentially kids reading through three different narratives. They get longer and longer, more loaded with details. What we're asking them to do is not to memorize them. We're asking them to summarize them. Really put them in your own words. Uh, and, and think about what is a lesson we can learn from this. Starting early on, um, we found that they were really having a hard time putting those summaries together. A lot of our kids would kind of tend to use more of a cut and paste approach. Interestingly, we saw this not just in our kind of moderate to severe end of the spectrum, but even for our kids with mild TBI. In our early samples, we saw as many as, many as 20% of those kids with mild TBI had comparable difficulties to kids with severe TBI in some of these higher order reasoning skills. What we really think was going on here was an emphasis in our kids with brain injury on a bottom-up approach to processing. So think about neuroplasticity, right? It's provided a lot of hope. We use this idea of strategic learning as a way in on that. So think about giving kids the ability to take a lot of information in, come away with not only the what, but also the, the so what, and even the now what. So our mantra was we're gonna go top down. Let's help them be more in the driver's seat, right, of how they learn. And so we're really pulling from cognitive and neural evidence of the value of something that's goal-oriented, something that you have to put into action. One of the gurus of the adolescent brain had this to say in an editorial several years ago. He said, one of the most useful skills for children and adolescents to acquire is going to be this ability to effectively use this universe of information. So we have to be able to critically evaluate the data. We know how important that is in this information age. We have to discern signal from noise, what's important, what's not. We have to be able to synthesize it and apply it. There really is value in taking more of a top-down approach in our assessment, in our interventions, for that more widespread functional impact. Here at the Center for Brain Health, again, I've been really fortunate to be involved in the research in brain injury we've been doing here uh, for well over 20 years now, and this is largely under the guidance and mentorship of our founder and chief director, Dr. Sandy Chapman. She was one of the first to really pioneer the emphasis and the value of supporting kids in the long term. I love this quote of hers where she said, we really need to consider treating TBI as a chronic condition. Seeing this new frontier, I like to call resilience building. Think about this, it's a phrase we use a lot here at the center. What could we do to be left of boom? In other words, what could we do before the impact even happens 